Hey, thank you, Tammy, and thank you all for having us today. We appreciate the opportunity. There is a lot of legislative activity going on, um, and my three colleagues, Patrick, Zane, and John, are going to be presenting an excellent summary for all of you. Um, on my end, uh, again, my name is Tamina Ahmed. I am the Managing Partner for Client Relations, and I'm lucky to be working with these three gentlemen. Um, as of July of this year, I've completed my 22nd year with the firm. I look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Feel free to look us up on our website or the contact information here. And please feel free to call us, share with us your stories. Uh, we know uh, well, safety is our priority for you, and so we want to ensure that we are there to help you along with all of the COVID-related questions that you may have. With that, I'm going to take it over to Patrick Gorman. Patrick? Hi, uh, thank you very much, Tia. And uh, again, my name is Patrick Gorman. I'm the Managing Attorney at the Bradford and Barcel Reading Office. I initially started with the firm in the Bay Area, Bay Area, San Jose, in our open office now in Concord, California. Uh, looking forward to working with you all on, on covering this legislation. Uh, us three have been covering, actually uh, all four of us, have been working on our COVID response team from the beginning of this. So we're very versed. We've handled actual cases, litigated and unlitigated, discovery questions. So anything that comes up, uh, let us know. I, I, I'm not even hesitant to say that all of us are subject matter experts on coronavirus and how they pertain to workers' compensation claims. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Zane. Hi, I'm Zane Uriberry. I'm from the Ontario office, and I've been handling some of these COVID cases since the very beginning. I currently have over 20 litigated claims. Um, I also advise clients on non-litigated matters, answering general questions, assisting with drafting denial language, um, and investigations and some contact tracing. So uh, we're well versed in uh, dealing with these cases. We've got a lot of firsthand experience also in dealing with them. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of the new legislation for ongoing claims. But uh, first, we're gonna hand it off to John. Thank you, Zane. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. And I hope everyone had a good Labor Day weekend. Um, I'm a partner in the Woodland Hills office. We just moved over there from Tarzana. And uh, I'm also the director of the editorial department, which means that I oversee the blogs on the website. So if you take a look at bradfordbarthel.blogspot.com, you'll see that we have a number of uh, blog articles this year, and we have at least 10 of them on COVID-19, the legislation, including about uh, Senate Bill 1159. Uh, before I got to Bradford and Barthel, I was the legal editor at WorkComp Central for about six years. Um, there, I summarized the case law for them during that time and covered Work comp legal decisions in California, but also in all 50 states. So everything from the District Court of Appeal uh, to federal appellate court stuff to the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. And, um, and as far as factual scenarios, I've summarized hundreds, if not thousands of them um, as a journalist and then also as an attorney. Um, and prior to Work Comp Central, I was a newspaper uh, reporter and journalist and editor. So that gave me a strong background and how businesses work, so I can really envision well as to what various employers are doing, how they're set up, and so forth. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's get started. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, so the big news is uh, Senate Bill 1159, and that is the big work comp bill uh, with COVID-19 presumptions, and that was just enrolled on Friday, actually. And so what does that mean? That means that they uh, officially entered it into the legislation, or they officially entered it into um, into the books, and they are now proofreading it, and then they're going to send it to Governor Newsom's desk probably tomorrow after giving it one last proofread. Um, so, yeah, that being said, it'll probably take him at least a week or two to sign off on it, um, and technically he has until September 30th to approve it. Um, so if he approves it, he'll sign it. Uh, he could also veto it and effectively kill it. And then there's also a little used provision where he can ask for more changes. So he could send it back to the legislature and say, I don't like this provision. Uh, please edit this or make a change uh, as you see fit here. But that being said, I think most of us think that he's going to sign off and approve it. Uh, once signed, it does take effect immediately because this is emergency legislation. And this legislation contains multiple rebuttable presumptions, 
which we'll get into in slide six here. And Tammy, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so the three rebuttable presumptions in Senate Bill 1159 uh, are the executive order, and that covers from March 19th through July 5th. And then there's also a presumption for police, fire, and many healthcare workers from July 6th all the way through January 1st, 2023. Uh, the third rebuttable presumption is a presumption for everybody else from July 6th through again, January 1st, 2023. And, uh, and so what we'll cover uh, next is, oh, uh, I'm sorry. As far as today's presentation, um, I'll be covering the police, fire, and healthcare workers presumption. Zane will be covering the everybody else presumption. And Patrick will be covering the executive order part of the uh, uh, Senate Bill 1159. And I should note during Patrick's portion, um, you want to pay attention during that. And the reason why is that most of the existing COVID cases right now have dates of injury during that executive order timeframe. And there were also a few tweaks to the executive order, a few changes that Senate Bill 1159 made. Okay, uh, let's go over to slide seven, please. So uh, before we go further, what if someone isn't covered by any of these presumptions? What happens to their claim? Are they out of luck? And the answer is no. Uh, they, they still can effectively prove their claim. What they have to prove is proved by, by a preponderance of the evidence that their work put them at greater risk of catching COVID-19. And there would be a 90-day decision time frame if their claim is not covered by one of the presumptions. So just because they aren't covered by one of the presumptions, uh, they can still effectively get a, uh, get a compensable COVID claim if they do show that it was work-related. Uh, so I didn't want people to forget about that. And one other important thing to note is that if it is a claim that is not covered by the presumptions, um, you still wanna do a strong factual investigation at the outset and build a timeline at the outset with your, factual, with your factual investigation. And by timeline, I mean, when did they work? When did their symptoms start? When was their positive test? When did they go to the doctor? All those events build a timeline, and that will help you fight a claim which is not covered by one of these presumptions. That same info will also help you fight the presumption claims as well. Um, okay, so let's go on to slide number eight. And so this presumption is a rebuttable presumption for police, fire, and health, health workers. And it says that COVID-19 is industrial if they have tested positive within 14 days of the employee performing labor or services at the employer's direction. And this applies to all firefighters, peace officers, law enforcement, and specific healthcare workers. Next slide, please. So who are these healthcare workers that are specifically covered by Senate Bill 1159 and this rebuttable presumption? Well, it mentions an employee who provides direct patient care, so they're working directly with the patient, or custodial employees um, in contact with COVID-19 patients uh, who work at a health facility. So that could include, for example, a laundry worker who goes into a room, a COVID patient's room, you know, picks up the dirty laundry and takes it over to the laundromat. Uh, so that person could be covered by this presumption under a healthcare worker. Other healthcare workers include RNs, EMTs, paramedics, and also employees who provide direct patient care for a home health agency. Next slide, please. Uh, so like the executive order, the police, fire, and health presumption has a 30-day decision time frame. So if it's not denied within 30 days, it is presumed compensable. If it is presumed compensable, only evidence after day 30 may be used to rebut the claim. And what starts the 30-day decision time frame for police, fire, and healthcare workers? Uh, that the filing of the DWC-1 form. So that's what starts that 30-day period. Next slide, please. Now, for employers of the healthcare workers I just mentioned, 
Uh, they do have the ability to rebut claims by proving that the applicant did not have contact with the patient who tested positive for COVID within the last 14 days of their employment. Uh, so that is, that is a good defense, and it is specifically mentioned um, in the statute created by Senate Bill 1159. Uh, so that is a good defense. And frankly, for other employers too, um, even though it, they aren't mentioned specifically under that clause, uh, that's also a good way to rebut uh, presumption claims and non-presumption claims as well by showing that, hey, there was no virus at the workplace. And with that, I'll kick it over to Zane to cover the everybody else presumption. Hi, this is Zane Uribe from the Ontario office. And yes, the everyone else part. And this is going to be uh, essentially it's the third section of the new law, uh, which will be Labor Code Section 3212.88, probably easiest just to refer to this as Section 88. This is claims for everyone who is not a first responder and that have dates of injury that are from July 6th, 2020, going until New Year's Day on 2023. And so this particular portion of the bill will cover those claims, govern those claims, and it provides a presumption for July 6th claims onward. Um, and so what essentially does this say? And the key difference in this particular uh, portion of the presumption is that there is a 45-day decision time frame. Under the executive order, we had 30 days in order to do an investigation. The 90 days was no longer there. We were down to 30. Now going forward for claims from July 6th, we're going to have 45 days. Uh, and when does the 45 days start? Which is always a good question. It starts when the claim form is filed. So it's not 45 days from the onset of symptoms or 45 days from the date of injury or the date of the test, but it's 45 days from the date the claim form is filed. And during that time, you can do some investigation, but if the claim is not denied within those 45 days, then it will be a presumed compensable case. You can always rebut the presumption with information that is discovered after the 45 days. And the specific language in the bill states that you just have to discover the information uh, after the 45 days in order to use it uh, to rebut the presumption. Uh, there's no requirement of any kind of uh, reasonableness in terms of whether or not you could have found the information. Uh, it's just whether or not the information was found. So this everyone else uh, presumption, uh, what are the criteria that are required in order to have this particular presumption apply? And we'll go to the next slide. The Essentially, it's many of the same elements that we already had under the executive order uh, with some changes. So going forward, uh, the, uh, this presumption will only apply to employers that have at least five employees. An individual must test positive for COVID-19, and they must do so within 14 days of performing work for the employer. And the last element, which is new, is that there must be an outbreak at the specific place of employment within 14 days of the employee's test. We're kind of breaking down some of those elements that are there. You have to test positive for COVID-19 under the executive order. You could have had a diagnosis of COVID-19 followed by a test, but now you're required to just have a test. Testing is much more widespread now than it was when the executive order initially came out. So now you have to have that positive test going forward. It has to be within 14 days of work being performed. And that work just cannot be done solely at home. A lot of us are working from home. I'm obviously working from home uh, right now. Uh, and some people are doing a hybrid. They're going into work sometimes, maybe one day a week, maybe one day every two weeks, or maybe for specific events. So that is something that you wanna look at. Did the individual actually work within 14 days of that positive test? Uh, and then the outbreak has to occur, and the outbreak is very well defined. And let's look at some of the uh, criteria that are going to have to be met for an outbreak uh, to have uh, taken place. And this is a rule that we're calling the four and four rule, essentially. And we can go to the next slide. The four and four rule essentially states that if you have 100 employees, uh, or more at a particular location, then you have to have 4% of the individuals that are working at that location test positive for COVID-19, and that's with, within a 14-day period. So if they told you there wasn't gonna be any math, you know, there's suddenly math now. And if you have less than 100 employees at a location, you have to have four individuals test positive for COVID-19 within that 14-day 
period. So it's going to be, of course, highly relevant as to whether or not a particular location has 100 employees or more or fewer than 100 employees. Uh, and this will this could be very different based upon um, uh, different employers. Some employers may employ tens of thousands of people, but they very rarely will have more than 100 people at a particular location. So they might have one section of this uh, apply to some locations if they have 80 employees at a, at a location, and if they have 110 employees at a different location, then the percentage will be used. 4% of the employees that are at that particular location within the 14 day uh, time period. And the 14 days means that you could have an outbreak sometimes, and then no outbreak, and then another outbreak afterwards. So you really will have to be looking at the numbers, the number of positive tests that are within 14 days of any one particular employee who has filed a claim in order to determine if the, uh, um, in order to determine if the presumption applies. And we can go to, was there a question, John? Uh, yes, Zane. Uh there was a question about um, about the part of the presumption that applies to uh, uh, basically about the part of the presumption that applies to employees who must come into the work or that says that there is no presumption if they're only working from home. And so uh, basically, if the employee goes to work, but it's voluntary, would this be compensable if they got COVID-19 from a coworker on a date that the employee just decided to go into work? without the employer saying, hey, come on to work. Okay, so if an individual is, and this this kind of leads into what happened during the, uh, during the initial shutdown itself, if businesses were open, but they shouldn't have been open and people were working, they still would have been covered by the executive order. Uh, it's, the question is only whether or not you were performing work at the place of employment for the employer. Um, and if you were doing that, even if you weren't necessarily supposed to be there, or if you didn't have to be there, the only question is, did you actually go into work? Uh, and in terms of one case that I have, an individual went into work, uh, and they went into work for only one day, and then they tested positive for COVID-19. They had been out on a different leave, and then they had come back, um, and that would allow someone to qualify. Uh, another individual who had been out on another case that I have only came into work to tell the employer that they had had the positive test. Uh, and in that particular case, that didn't qualify as going to work within 14 days of having your positive test. So it is a, a rather strict rule as to whether or not you have actually been into the employer's place of work during that 14 day period. So that's essentially what we are looking for. Okay. So what is the 14 days? And there's a lot of days that are involved and a lot of days we have to keep track of when we're looking at these cases. In terms of trying to do contact tracing, we always look at the date that symptoms began. And then we go back about two weeks and try to piece together an individual's activities, where they've been, who they came in contact with, uh, what events they may have been at. Then there's also a last day worked. There's a date an individual was tested and a date they received the positive test. So there's a lot of different days here. But statutorily now, the legislature has stated that the date of injury will be the last day that an employee worked for the employer. So we don't have to uh, get into uh, what was the actual day that someone became ill or are they going to be filing a CT claim. It's simply the last day that they worked. Uh, and then there will be the test that they have to take, and they take the COVID test. And when we're looking at whether or not there is an outbreak, the outbreak has to be within 14 days of that test. Um, and this can be a little bit confusing because it can be 14 days on either side. So if you have an individual on August 31st who tests positive, you want to look and see if there was an outbreak. Was there 4% of the individuals there that tested positive? Uh, if it's 100 employees or more, if it's under 100 employees where there are four people that tested positive, and that includes the individual who is making the claim. But you would need to go back to August 17th, look at those 14 days. You may have to even go all the way out uh, to September 14th or any combination thereof, five days before the date of the test, nine days after, and look at that 14-day period uh, in order to determine if there is an outbreak. So when you determine uh, the numbers, and if it turns out there was no outbreak, and we can go to uh, the next slide, what happens then? 
because we still are operating here with a presumption. And if there is no outbreak, and this is for claims from July 6th going forward, uh, then if there's no outbreak, then there's not going to be a presumption. This is going to be something that's going to be uh, litigated almost for sure. Uh, trying to decide whether or not there was an outbreak is going to be done initially by the adjusters because there are some reporting requirements. The employers have to go ahead and let the claims um, administrator know about cases that have occurred in the workplace within a particular time frame, and then adjusters use that information in order to make a determination as to whether or not there is an outbreak. Ultimately, the numbers, including the number of employees that were at a particular location, uh, the definition of what is a particular location, uh, and then the number of people that were sick within a time frame, that'll ultimately be something that a judge will likely have to look at and make a determination as to whether or not there has been an outbreak. But initially, that determination is gonna have to be done at the by the adjuster at that level. And we can go to the next slide. And sort of how are you supposed to uh, figure this out? The, the new law subsections I and K have uh, quite a bit of uh, reporting requirements in terms of what information the employers need to send over to the claims administrator. They need to send over information related to whether or not somebody tested positive without identifying the person um, unless that person has filed a workers' compensation claim. So otherwise, there would just be uh, a notation that on August 1st, an individual tested positive, and then those records would have to be kept. Uh, so there's no personal information kept about the employee, just that they tested positive. Uh, the number of other people there that had tested positive, and those records have to be kept within a 45-day time period in order to track whether or not an outbreak had occurred. We can go to the next slide. So earlier we had said that an individual, uh, when we were looking at the, the different dates that are involved here, uh, testing positive within that 14-day uh, period, and that's really what you have to look at. It's the date of the test. It's not the date of the result, because sometimes it may take days or even weeks to get a result back. But what we are looking at solely is the date of the actual test. And that's language that's directly in the statute. So the date of the positive test will be the date the individual was actually tested. That very likely will be different than an individual's last day worked. Uh, I looked at the 20 litigated cases that I have, and I only had two cases where the individual's last day work was also the date that they were tested for COVID-19. So those two dates will have to be uh, kept track of and considered because when determining whether there's an outbreak, you have to look at the date uh, tested. But when you're looking at the date of injury, that is the last day worked. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, many of these cases initially were filed as continuous trauma claims. It was very difficult to pinpoint an exact time when an individual would have become uh, infected. So usually a CT claim was filed. Uh, but now here we have specifically in the legislation it's stating that the last day that an individual worked will be the date of injury. Uh, this raises some concerns, especially in cases where uh, an individual has concurrent employment. You very easily could have a case where someone files a claim for COVID-19 with both employers and they would have two different dates of injury because they would have possibly worked for one employer up until say a Monday, but then gone into work on Tuesday for a different employer, then not felt, felt well, tested, and tested positive. So there will be some issues regarding who tested positive, uh, when, which employer is gonna be um, responsible ultimately for that when they're concurrent employers. I think there's a fairly decent argument that the uh, individual who has the earlier date of injury, that, that date of injury would probably be the one uh, that would be controlling because you'd be able to say that they were they were ill already before they had the last day of work with the second employer, uh, but there will likely be some uh, reimbursement issues uh, to be decided there. But that's something to think about uh, concurrent employers. The next slide, and then we're looking at testing that is done. The, the testing has been, there are many different types of tests. And when looking at the kinds of tests, 
uh, that are talked about here in this bill, we are looking for the tests specifically that are looking for COVID-19 RNA. Uh, and those are the tests that are approved by the FDA. There is a website that identifies which tests can be used, but the long and short of it is for claims after July 6th or from July 6th going forward. You have to use one of those tests. You cannot use an antibody test. Uh, you cannot use any of the uh, other tests that are not specifically listed there. John, do we have another question? Yes. Um, um, so we had a good question um, from a employer who, and let me just locate that here. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble locating that one now. Is it the one that starts with do employers automatically provide? Is it that one? John? No, it's, uh, I found it. Okay, it's okay. our employees work at locations where we may have less than 100 employees but our customer has more than 100 employees. So for example, think of janitorial services where um, the janitor shows up and you know they go clean the office building where, uh, where there's easily more than 100 em employees. Uh, does that satisfy the 100 employee rule under the four and four or four or four rule? That is a very good question. And we would be looking at the number of employees that work for that particular employer, but not the overall contact that an individual might have uh, with the public at large or with other individuals. And let's take let's take a warehouse as an example. At a warehouse, you may have delivery drivers uh, that that show up, uh, but they would not be counted in that number because the statute specifically states employees. So you're looking at just employees for the for the uh, employer that employs the individual who has filed the claim. Uh, this new law also doesn't take into account places that are open to the public. Uh, so it doesn't take into account any kind of um, a place where people come in and buy things on the retail level uh, or they're provided with services of any kind. Uh, you, you could think very easily of um, something like a uh, auto mechanic where there might only be uh, five or six people even working there, but they may see over a 14-day period several hundred customers. Uh, that wasn't taken into account when the legislation was done, uh, neither retail either. If you could think of someone who works um, as a cashier, they will encounter hundreds to possibly thousands of individuals every day, and that, that's another possible source of COVID-19, uh, and that wasn't taken into account. So when you're looking at the uh, for purposes of determining an outbreak, you're looking at employees that are at that specific location for that employer. Um, and the location is also identified because if you have a location that has multiple buildings, it is very possible that each building itself is its own separate place of employment. So they, the whole center might not be taken into account. Um, also, if you do have employees that go to multiple stores, if you have, say, a retail outlet, and employees travel to multiple locations, all of those locations have to be considered together uh, as an individual's place of employment. So you would have to keep track not only of who's working where, uh, but have they worked at any other locations within the 14 days that they tested positive. Um, and then next slide, and this one is on uh, death benefits um, and death benefits where there is no dependence, uh, just like under the executive order, uh, those need not be paid to the state. That has been waived now and has been waived statutorily. So going forward, uh, if there is a death claim, uh, the death claim will have to have a verified uh, dependence in order to recover. And checking on dependency and who is a dependent uh, is, of course, very important. Um, sometimes people will claim to be dependents uh, that aren't, or they'll claim to be the only dependent. And as we know, we do have to dig into that. We do have to investigate and see who else might be a uh, possible dependent before any death benefits are paid out. And with that, I am going to pass it on to Patrick Gorman. He is going to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, the executive order and how that's been codified. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I popped on a little late. I was responding to a bunch of uh, questions in the in the uh, window here. Um, okay, so I'm going to cover uh, just a recap really quick. Senate Bill 1159, that is the only one that passed, has three separate rebuttable presumptions, right? So we have the first responders, if you will, fire, uh, police officers, healthcare workers um, that John spoke about, and that's our 30-day decision time frame. 
Senate Bill 1159, uh, this section for police, fire, and healthcare workers is only going to address injuries from July 6th, 2020 until January 1st, 2023. I saw a comment in the, the questions about that being an extraordinarily long, uh, far out horizon, and that's absolutely correct. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a tipping of the hand of how long they think this is going to last, or they just wanted to be extra safe that they didn't have to renew it. But that is the uh, the horizon, January 1st, 2023. To everyone else, uh, again, July 6th, uh, go back, Kenny, sorry, July 6th, 2020 through January 1st, 2023. That's a 45 day decision time frame. It was just covered by Zane. And then there is a separate section of the labor code in this Senate bill that covers the period of the executive order. So that's from March 9th, 2020 through July 5th, 2020. So let's just clarify everything after July 5th, 2020 has to either be under the everyone else, the 404 rule, or they have to be a healthcare worker or for other first responders. Uh, if they aren't, don't fall under the, the 404 rule and they're not a first responder and the date of injury is after July 5th, 2020, then they have to prove up injury under the Valley Fever standard. Uh, that would be a standard claim with your 90 day denial that John spoke about earlier. Um, your 90 day investigatory time frame and the burden is on the claimant to show that their, uh, the condition of their work, uh, exposed them to a heightened risk of contracting COVID-19. Okay. Next slide. So we're going to go back to the executive order. And a lot of you have probably received training on this already. I know we've been giving it. There are some nuances that, that are significant that may uh, require you to revisit some of your determination. Um, so let's not forget about the, the executive order. The, the bulk of the executive order was just essentially cut and pasted into the Senate bill, but there are some uh, separate uh, some separate issues. And this codifies it. So a lot of the, the statements and a lot of other trainings earlier about potential constitutional challenges uh, are no longer uh, an issue because it's been codified. There might be an argument that they can't retroactively change the law, uh, there's a huge body of law on that. I think the University of Washington School of Law wrote like 137 page analysis on that. Uh, if it's not criminal law, it's not typically an ex post facto type issue. So uh, I think that by codifying the executive order, it, it does eliminate some of the appeals challenges that they were spoken about by other firms earlier on here. Uh, we'll go to the next section. Okay, so the executive order in a time of disorder, I, I like this title. Uh, and unfortunately, because we had an executive order that we were operating under for several months um, and covering even a longer period of time because it was backdated to March 19th, uh, they changed some of the requirements that we made determinations on. So and they caused even more disorder. Uh, but we'll go through it. It covers all workers. So it's it's um, anybody and everybody who went to work, whether their, their office or their business should have been open or not, uh, from March 19th until July 5th. Uh, it required a positive test or diagnosis within 15 days of their last date of work at the employer's location. This specifically did not cover workers who were working at home. Um, there are some nuance there. Uh, it's not really covered in the executive order, but if somebody works for uh, as an in-home health supportive services person uh, and they work in their home and their uh, beneficiary that they're providing care for had positive, I, I don't know how that would really flush out. Um, just remember most deference at the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, at least at the trial level, is towards extending benefits to the injured worker. Uh, diagnosis must have been a positive test within 30 days of a diagnosis. So uh, this created two separate standards of a positive um, or, or the presumption to apply. It could have been a positive test first or a diagnosis followed by a positive test in 30 days. Um, and that's, this is all still true in the legislation that was passed. We'll go to the next slide. The executive order, uh, again, only applies to injured workers who work at their job site at the uh, employer's direction. So if somebody went to um, their office to, you know, play online poker or something like that, um, or, or make a YouTube video or blog or anything like that, and it wasn't at their employer's direction, I guess that would fall outside of the, um, the executive order. Uh, it did not employ, apply to employees who work from home only. If somebody was traveling, so if you have a flex schedule or somebody works from home four days a week and in the office one day a week and they have a positive COVID test, that might fall under the presumption. Uh, and there's no limitation to essential workers. So it was all types of business. Again, even ones that were operating in violation of public health orders. We'll go to the next page. And, and I do want to add on, on 
the, if they're operating in violation of public health orders, you know, that's a coverage issue. You can talk to coverage counsel, but in my experience, coverage is very, uh, very, very rarely uh, rescinded retroactively. Um, so the executive order for somebody to qualify under the executive order and also under Senate Bill 1159 for these dates from March 19th through July 5th, they must have had a positive test uh, results, so a positive coronavirus test or a diagnosis within 14 days of performing the work. I know I've said that several times, but let's just keep that in scope. If, if they don't have that, they don't have a diagnosis, let's say they didn't work for 30 days and then they have a positive test or they were diagnosed 30 days later, it doesn't, they don't fall under the presumption. They can try and prove up injury under a more uh, difficult standard, but good luck. If they can't prove it under the presumption, there are going to be very few fact patterns where they can then prove it without the presumption. Uh, now, I want, this is what I was referring to when I first started speaking. The Senate bill changes who can diagnose. And so there's going to be, there will be uh, AOE, COE determinations that we might have made from March 19th through July 5th that need to be revisited. Before it had to be, by a doctor, I'm sorry, a physician, or a surgeon certified by the California Board of Medicine. That was only an MD. It did not apply to DOs or anybody else. Uh, but now, under Senate Bill 1159, they retroactively changed the standard that permits an MD or a DO or a physician's assistant or nurse practitioner under acting under the, uh, the review or supervision of an MD or DO uh, to make a diagnosis. So if you have um, something from an urgent care clinic or telemedicine where you have a diagnosis from a nurse practitioner or a PA or a DO, and you denied injuries stating they don't fall under the executive order, uh, you may need to revisit those. And, you know, I, I know that it's frustrating because the question that's begged is how many of these did we, did we deny because they didn't have an MD certifying um, or diagnosing, but another type of medical professional. And you just need to work through it. Most clients of mine have a dedicated COVID team of five to 10 adjusters who are dealing with these. And these cases were few and far between. A lot of folks had uh, just a positive test or no diagnosis. But again, um, they have to be, uh, it, it, the standard was changed. So you do have to go through and revisit those. It still may be a denial. If you did your investigation and you were able to rebut factually, you can still maintain your denial, but you're gonna have to revisit those and issue a revised notice. A lot of clients I have are concerned more about audit unit assessments than they are about the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. Uh, the fear being because of budgetary crunches and constraints and, and uh, lack of, of public funding due to tax revenues dropping off that the audit unit is going to be uh, shaking every pillar they can to find assessments. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you, if you have something that was not, that was denied because it was certified by a DO or a PA or diagnosed rather, um, talk to your supervisor because the audit unit assessments are going to be the concern there. Uh, the, if there is a diagnosis, no matter if it's from an NBDO or a nurse or a PA, the diagnosis must be confirmed within uh, 30 days of the diagnosis. And that's usually going to be done with an antibody test. Um, I, th I think when this was drafted, the initial, the initial contemplation was somebody would be diagnosed uh, and then told to go to a testing facility and they'd go there within a couple of days and it would confirm the, the diagnosis. Uh, but we do have applicants attorneys claiming that they're going to now file claims with um, antibody tests. Uh, so keep in mind when they make that threat, uh, there better be a diagnosis and that antibody test better be within 30 days. Otherwise they don't fall under the presumption. Okay, next question or next slide. Uh, with these under the executive order uh, timeframe, so from March 19th until July 5th, there is still a 30-day time frame. They didn't revise the time frame, even though they revised all of our standards for who apply, who falls under the executive order. And again, the 30 days does not start until the claim form is returned by an injured worker signed. Honeywell is still good law. They, they specifically reference the claim form requirement and those labor code sections in both the executive order and in the statute. However, if you do not make a timely determination within 30 days, it is presumed uh, compensable, presumes that you have an injurious, uh, that you have a compensable injury. You have an actual viable comp case uh, that you can only deny retroactively with evidence discovered after the 30 days. We'll go to the next slide. So you can <clears throat> rebut uh, with evidence discovered subsequent to the 30 day period. And I'll share a, a war story, if you will. Uh, we have a case where a woman was hospitalized with acute kidney failure, diagnosed with coronavirus related acute kidney failure, told the doctor she never had any problems with her kidneys before. So we have a diagnosis. Um, 
I don't believe there was a positive test in that case, uh, but we have a diagnosis, we have a claim filed, we're worrying about a hospital bill and all of these other things. Uh, we then get medical records, claim was admitted because it wasn't time we did. We then have medical records uh, that come in eight weeks after the hospitalization that uh, provide that the diagnosis was actually revived after her third day in the hospital. They found in her, her medical history and her obviously the database that, that uh, medical providers share that she suffered from chronic kidney disease level three and was treating under a nephrologist with dialysis before she was hospitalized and lied to the staff. So they added it to the doctors at the ER. So they revised their diagnosis on the discharge paperwork. So you have 20 pages saying that she has coronavirus related kidney failure and then uh, one paragraph on the last page saying that she did not have coronavirus and actually had chronic kidney disease. Uh, so we were we received that document, those documents two months after the injury was claimed. We then retroactively denied based upon that. So that's an example of how you can rebut with evidence um, discovered after the 30-day period. A lot of the times when we're doing these 30-day investigations, we're relying on the injured workers, <coughs> excuse me, to be truthful. And the only way to really verify that, because you usually can't get a depot set in that time frame, is through a so social media check. And um, again, we're just requiring on them, or we're relying on them to be forthcoming. And most of these cases don't result in any kind of benefits really owed. People are sick for two weeks, they go back to work, and the overwhelming majority of these cases. Uh, but if it becomes a litigated case, or a death case, for example, and you start subpoenaing records and deposing people, you can retroactively deny. Uh, it does not say that it has to be evidence that could have been discovered. Uh, so again, we know that there's some case law saying, well, shame on you, insurance company. You didn't do your diligence. Um, you should have known that this was, in fact, the case before you did not timely deny. Uh, that that wording is not in the executive order or in Senate Bill 1159. And I think they do acknowledge that this is a very abbreviated investigatory time frame. Next page. So discover new evidence uh, after our initial 30 days. You can rebut the presumption. So even if you have a compensable uh, injury, because it, you didn't have enough to, to rebut. You didn't have enough to prove that it was more probably than not contracted outside of the place of employment. Always continue discovery. Uh, always continue following up and tying up loose ends um, as far as, as the, the AOE-COE causative question. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And now I'm gonna cover TD. And, and I think that this is actually the most important topic that we have to cover because this is where the litigation usually happens, right? So we have somebody who uh, tests positive or is diagnosed with coronavirus is taken off work. Uh, and for some reason or another, and, and I've had so several of these cases where uh, somebody will test positive six times in a row and they keep going to the same facility and testing positive. And then the case will come to me, we'll get them to a different location and magically they're negative. So we know that these tests aren't the most accurate. Um, so in that time, the COVID time is already burnt out, whether they fall under the CARES Act or not, um, they're now you know, working, they're not working and they have no income. And a lot of people also don't qualify for EDD benefits because of employment status or something along those lines. So in their mind, they can't pay bills. They are told they can't come to work because they don't have a negative test by their employer uh, and they're gonna hire an attorney. So this is where the litigation occurs. So you have to make sure that uh, we, we address these questions and complicating matters, the legislature change the standard that we've been operating under uh, with the executive order. So keep in mind, uh, CARES Act question comes up a lot, and that's 300, That's under 300 employees, the CARES Act applies. That's 14 days, I'm sorry, two weeks of paid time off for COVID. Uh, employers who are larger than that don't fall under the CARES Act. Almost all of them are providing some kind of COVID pay uh, to differing degrees. Some are you know, 40 hours, some are 80 hours, uh, some are you know, as long as the person's off work. Uh, but that time must be exhausted before the, the injured worker is entitled to temporary disability. However, keep in mind, this is only time specifically set aside for COVID-related compensation. This isn't personal time off that they had prior to January of this year. Uh, this is only COVID-related time. Uh, and this also applies to 4850 benefits for public safety officers. Uh, any any COVID-related time has to be exhausted first. Okay, next slide. When does TD begin? So let's say you have a, a, care, a non CARES Act employer who does not have any CARES Act or any COVID time set aside for their employees. TD begins immediately. There is no three day requirement. Um, and TD begins immediately upon the 
the expiration of any COVID time. So if somebody is out beyond their COVID-related time, beyond the 80 hours or 40 hours or however long it may be, temporary disability benefits commence immediately. Um, they, this is where it gets complicated, though. The qualification requirements for TD are different than under a standard workers' compensation claim, and that applies to 4850 benefits as well. So next slide. So they must be certified for uh, temporary disability within the first team, for first 15 days after the initial diagnosis or positive test. And this created a lot of issues. So we, I have countless cases that, uh, that maybe were, were compensable because we have a positive test. We have no way to rebut um, the, we know that they were exposed at work. You know, they were treating a patient who had COVID and uh, they didn't do anything outside. They lived alone, et cetera. Um, so we weren't able to rebut the presumption but they never received work status from the appropriate uh, licensed um, person. So, or they didn't receive it until, you know, I had a case where they tested positive on April 12th and they didn't provide work status certification until July 2nd. So it was untimely. So just as in the executive order, this legislation requires that work status must be certified within the first 15 days after either diagnosis or positive test. It's whichever one is first though. So if somebody's diagnosed and then they test positive two weeks later, it's not 15 days from the positive test, it's 15 days from the diagnosis. And they also must recertify for every, every 15 days thereafter for the first 45 days. So they have to be recertified every 15 days for 45 days, three times uh, in a row. And if they aren't properly certified, then they're not entitled to TD. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't have a compensable injury. This means that they, it doesn't mean that they're not entitled to disability benefits from EDD. This does mean that you are not liable for temporary disability benefits. And again, let me just reiterate, this is four dates of injury from March 19th through July 5th. It doesn't say what happens after the first 45 days. What I presume happens is it just is the regular standard of work certification every 45 days after the first 45 days. So first 45 days, it has to be every 15 days, so three times in those 45 days. And then after that, it most likely rolls over to the the regular workers' compensation standard um, of every 45 days thereafter. We'll go to the next slide. And this is where it, it, they, they kept this in the statute, and this was in the executive order. It created a lot of confusion um, with, with claims departments doing their investigation. Okay, so, uh, and this is for temporary disability and 4850 benefits. You have to separate these claims into two separate um, baskets if you will. The first basket is going to be those claims from March 19th until May 5th or prior to the executive order. And then the second basket is for those that occurred May 6th up until July 5th after the executive order. If we're taking the positive test or diagnosis prior to May 6th, so prior to the executive order, they must obtain the CD certification, the TD certification within 15 days of the executive order. So for people who have a positive test in April or May 1st or whatever the day may be, as long as it's May 5th or earlier, um, they, they had to have TD certification by May 21st. If they did not, they are not entitled to temporary disability. Maybe they're entitled to SDI, maybe they're entitled to FMLA, but they are not entitled to temporary disability. And that is clear and expressed in both the executive order and in the statute. However, if it is after May 5th, so we'll go to the next slide, Dan. So if it's after May 6th, um, then it would be within 15 days of the diagnosis or the positive test. So if, for example, if they were on May 15th, then they would have to have been by May 13th, um, so forth. Uh, this next slide is where you really need to focus because, again, this is where we're going to have to revisit a lot of TD denial notices. Um, before, the standard was the same as a diagnosis standard. It had to be TD had to be certified by an MD, basically a physician or and surgeon licensed to practice in California by the California Board of Medicine. They changed the standard in this statute, um, in, in this Senate, retroactively back to March 19th. Uh, so now it's a physician uh, pursuant to Chapter 5, Division 2 of the Business and Professions Code, which means an MD or a DO. And I'm sorry, but this is confusing again, because remember, what did I say as far as certification? They changed that to an MD, a DO, a PA, or an NP. However, with temporary disability certification under the statutes that they're passing, 
it has to be by an MD or a DO. Okay, so the diagnosis standard is one thing. The TD standard is something entirely different, and both are different than they were in the executive order. So we have to go in and revise our TD denial. We have to revisit those TD denials because I know specifically uh, my clients have denied several cases, uh, TD in several cases, where a DO certified disability. So we have to go back through all of those and send a revised TD notice. In most cases, pay TD. And in that case, they all receive EDD benefits. So we have to stop and not just send out a TD check, all right? We have to stop, we have to contact EDD and confirm whether or not they're entitled to recovery so that we don't have to pay TD twice, once to the injured worker and once to EDD. So keep that in mind. Uh, you'll have all of our contact information. Please call, email, whether it's gonna be a litigated case, a case coming to B&B or not, please just contact us with any fact patterns that really raise alarms on these changing and moving standards and guidelines. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. As I said before, 30 days have passed. Do not stop discovery. In those 30 days, we're relying on the veracity of an injured worker. Some people are just scared they're gonna get COVID and claim they have it. Um, some people get COVID and they don't wanna go back to work because they're scared they're going to catch it again. So you have complicated fact patterns and some people who already suffer from, um, you know, maybe underlying anxiety issues and everything, this really flares it up, it really aggravates it. So continue your discovery, continue asking questions. I have cases where we've done social media checks and found TikTok videos of somebody at Caesars in, in uh, Las Vegas, and they claim that they never left their house. So they may not be honest, and we may have to do further discovery. Things may come up. And when the rubber meets the road, and, and again, we're not seeing a lot of these liens coming in or, or claims being filed by hospitals yet. They're getting paid by the federal government. I don't think they really want to deal with insurance companies at this point. But what happens when those invoices aren't paid and they come back 12, 18, 36 months from now, right? So continue your discovery and make sure that you've tied up all loose ends. If there's anything uh, that, that, that is of concern, if it's somebody who may be tested positive for COVID, um, you know that they had contact with somebody who had COVID in the workplace, you know, skilled nursing facility or hospital, something along those lines and they went back to work after 10 days, maybe that's not a case where you're setting a depot. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying file an application in every single case. However, you should keep discovery open and any, any kind of red flag or, or uh, contradiction or any kind of record where there's uh, costs that, that may be sitting out there that are coming back because you don't want to be um, later on uh, hamstrung from defending against a case that should maybe not have been admitted had you known the facts. Um, even if the claim is presumed compensable, Make sure you conduct discovery if there are any kind of if there's any kind of exposure. Uh, the next issue is death uh, death claims. Uh, in this case, we're going to do pretty much the opposite of what we do in a regular death claim. In a regular death claim, we're looking for dependents. We're trying to find partial dependents. If somebody dies without, um, if somebody passes away and they don't have a spouse or a child, we're going to try to find a partial dependent so that we can settle up with them for twenty five thousand dollars instead of paying the uh, death without dependents unit uh, 250 grand or more. With regards to COVID deaths, they are specifically waiving, the state of California is specifically waiving collection of all benefits, any and all benefits. So somebody passes without dependents, we're not gonna go shake down and look for dependents um, in order to avoid payment to OD legal. We're going to um, look for dependents to know if we have exposure, but we're not going to stretch as far to, to find a dependent on uh, marginal grounds. Uh, we're going to, if somebody doesn't have a dependent, then they don't have a dependent. We don't have to worry about further exposure aside from maybe burial costs. The Department of Industrial Relations, the general fund is not going to collect anything in any COVID death case. The only collection will be to dependents, partial, total, or otherwise. Um, how much is saved? We'll go to the next slide. So we're not paying any death benefits. We're not paying any accrued TD, PD, or anything else. Uh, if there is no dependents, then there are no benefits owed. Next slide. Uh, who cares? Again, it was we thought it was only for a few months. We know that this is through January 1st, 2023. One thing I wanna add, and Zane's gonna cover this, he's gonna talk about discovery. Um, if you have a death case, look for a COVID test because I haven't had, a, I've had no death cases where they've actually tested for COVID. They listed as one of 17 causes of death without any pathology confirming the person had coronavirus. 
And Zane, with that, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you, everybody. Definitely always look for that positive test for all of the claims. Many people are just off of work because they may have been exposed to somebody who had COVID-19, but they themselves didn't actually test positive. So the test is, as Patrick said, absolutely key. So what can you do here? And I'm just gonna, uh, for a couple of minutes, uh, talk about discovery, what you need it to do in order to investigate one of these claims. You go to the next slide. You have to build a timeline. You have to find out when an individual became ill, what were their first symptoms, what was the date of the onset, and then you want to go back about 14 days, that's about the latency period of the virus, and you want to see where they went and what they did, uh, what kind of activities they were involved in, uh, wh what family members may have been sick. I have multiple cases where individuals live in a household where someone else was sick first with COVID, and it's much more likely that that individual would have contracted COVID from a family member when there's no social distancing, no use of personal protective uh, equipment in the home, and much less likely that they would have contracted it uh, at their place of employment. In fact, the new uh, law, Section 88, allows specifically for you to look at the protective measures that are taken by an employer uh, in order to rebut the presumption and also to look at the possible exposures that an individual would have on a non-industrial basis. So always do that investigation. Uh, make sure that you look at social media. Uh, social media has been crucial in some of the cases that I have, and we check social media uh, right away uh, because you would be surprised at how quickly uh, individuals' Facebook profiles become private, how quickly Instagram accounts are deleted uh, once they're asked about in a deposition. Um, I had that happen. I asked someone for their Instagram account and it was gone in about 10 minutes. Um, but we had already obtained the information that we needed before the deposition. So we, we had the evidence of other exposures. You can go to the next slide, Tammy, and then even the, the slide after that. Um, so uh, always ask the employer also about personal protective equipment that is used uh, at the work site. Uh, that information is very vital, especially for claims that are after July, they're from July 6th onward. Uh, what kind of tools were used and what was the enforcement of using those tools. And then you can go to the next slide. Continue continue to uh, investigate by issuing subpoenas to medical uh, doctors, any place where the applicant may have treated. The information that, that an individual provides to their doctor is usually true, right? When they get sick, they will go to the doctor and they may tell the doctor, I got sick because my cousin is sick. Um, I have one individual who admitted that they became uh, ill because their babysitter uh, had COVID-19, passed it to their child, and then passed it to them. And that kind of information you glean out of the medical records. So it's important to obtain that information because that can be used to rebut the presumption even if the time for your decision has already passed. So remember, continue uh, discovery uh, even after your deadline has passed, whether that's 30 days or 45 days. You can go two more slides through, um, Tammy. So uh, essentially, if you have any questions regarding this, please feel free to contact us. Please feel free to ask questions, reach out. Uh, I know that Patrick, John, and I are answering uh, questions on cases litigated or not uh, every day. And a lot of these scenarios have uh, come up. We've seen a lot of different fact patterns, um, and we've had to deal with a lot of different issues. So we are happy to provide uh, any assistance as needed. Thank you for the opportunity and we look forward to providing service. If you need anything, you know where to reach us. Thank you for having us today.